welcome everybody. Uh, I'm sure you know by now I'm Nate and we're joined today by a good friend of mine and great beer salesman Dan Jennings who works now for Left Hand Brewing. I'll let him introduce himself and tell a little bit about himself here in just a moment but uh, you know the drill by now but just in case uh, there's a chat panel down there. If you have any questions we're happy to take questions throughout the presentation um, and this is being recorded so uh, for posterity, if there's any information you want to come back and view later, it should go uh, get posted up on the site later on this week. And uh, I think that's it for housekeeping. Um, like I said, ha happy to take questions throughout, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dan. So, Dan, uh, like I said, introduce yourself. Let us know how you came to be. Oh, you're on the guy. Yeah, so my name is Dan. I work for uh, Left Hand Brewing Company. And I currently do Arizona, New Mexico for the brewery. Uh, I know some echoing. I'm not sure if we can fix that. But anyways, yes, yeah, looks like Chris can recognize me. I get out and about quite a bit in Arizona, uh, especially in the Phoenix area. Oh, working all right in the. It's a little distracting. How's that? Anyways, so I've been with Left Hand for about two and a half years. I've been in the beer business for 10 years. Um, Nate is an old friend of mine from Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, worked in the chain world up there. Sold beer for a liquor and wine distributor, Southern Wine and Spirits. And got into selling craft beer for a craft beer distributor called Little Guy Distributing. And did that for about seven years or so, six years or so. And then I got a job working for Left Hand about two and a half years ago. And what I have today, I brought a slideshow. Oh, you remember this little guy? I brought a slideshow that this is something that we, uh, as sales reps, we present this in front of our sales rep, our force, forces at the different distributors. This is put on by our marketing team. They, but our marketing team puts us together. This is relatively new for us. So as we grow, we hire more people. We have a pretty solid marketing department right now. They provide us with this uh, slideshow. This is actually from the first quarter last year. But this is what we talked to to try to get our distributors uh, understanding our beers, understanding craft beer. A lot of our distributors are selling big beers like Miller Coors and the big guys. And we try to let them know about our brewery, the culture. And a little bit about our beers, and we also do incentive trips to try to get folks up to the brewery from our different distributors. And uh, so I'm thinking I'll probably run through some of these slides and throw questions at me. I'm not sure how familiar all of you are with Left Hand Brewing Company. We're up in Longmont, Colorado. Uh, we're in about 29 states. We're moving into other states, so I'm not exactly sure if that's accurate. We might be in. 30 or 31. We're moving into Southern California this year, Nevada, and we're going to expand a little bit up in Washington, Idaho, Alaska. We're moving into more states this year. But uh, so long, my Colorado. I've been around for 20, 21 years. In fact, I think I might just go to another slide here because I think I've got some info you can look at. I'll get to that. I'll get to the brewery history in a moment. Uh, this is a look at our barrels removed per year at our growth. We used to, uh, with the flat line there, it's a little hard for me to see it's in a small thing, but where the way the graph is kind of flat, we actually own a little distributorship as well. We distributed a bunch of uh, California beers and some Colorado beers in the uh, Denver market in the mountains near Denver. And then uh, as the graph starts growing steeper is when we sold the distributor. I started focusing more on making beer as well, of course, it correlates with the uh, craft beer, you know, boom or whatever you call that. So, I'm going to move to another slide here. So, this is just like I said, the something we show to our distributors, like I'd be out presenting this in front of 100 people or 50 people or six people. There it is. So we found in 1993, and this year we're hoping to make 90,000 barrels of beer. We made 
just under 65,000 barrels last year. And that, uh, that kind of brought us up, uh, I guess, in 2014, we were the 40th largest craft brewery in the country. And so we've got a lot we know. We're uh, pretty much just focusing on quality right now and uh, trying to buy more tanks. And yeah, the uh, boom during the economic downturn. But it is kind of interesting. We actually acquired another brewery up in Colorado, too, uh, the Tabernash. Kind of joined forces in the tough times. And there were many times uh, over the years when we almost went out of business. But through uh, careful financial spending, they kept kept everything afloat. And, and, and now we're in a little bit different boat. But uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, world out there. Who knows what's going to happen? There's thousands of breweries opening up, right? <laughs> and uh, we're kind of uh, we focus uh, we focus on like I said we focus on quality and we uh, we stress the fact that we're financially uh, sound right now. We don't uh, we're not taking big loans out uh, like a lot of a lot of small these breweries are taking big loans out. A lot of breweries are selling right now and. Uh, it's pretty interesting. All these big breweries that are being sold right now and bought by investors are, are big breweries. But we uh, we have a lot of we're buying properties around our breweries, so we're not planning on moving anywhere. We have no East Coast plans like a lot of these breweries are doing. Uh, it costs a lot of money. If maybe there's a little bit of a, a bubble burst or a plateau, where there's a thousand more breweries opening and making great beer and selling beer. We feel like we're going to be all right. And this is something we stress that the sugar is as well. Uh, so what are we going to do? Uh, social media. And uh, we do some advertising. We have, like I said, we have a new marketing team. But social media seems to be where it's at. That's something that all breweries are doing. And, uh, Dan, real quick. Um, so... Just for context, uh, Dan had shared that this slide deck is the most of what he received from the marketing team at a sort of Q1 sales meeting. And the idea is that this is a slide deck the marketing team shares with all the sales guys to provide some additional sales tools. And so uh, this is the, the kind of thing that marketing team from a decent sized craft brewer thinks it's probably useful for for uh, the, the on the ground sales guys uh, to go out and, and make sales. So um, that's that's why some of this information may not seem like what uh, maybe maybe the individual consumer is interested in in taking a look at. But the idea is that when Dan goes out and talks to a bar owner or a, a, a grocery chain and has that conversation that this is this is the kind of information that those decision makers are going to be more, more interested in and will help sell that uh, that brand, right, Dan? Yeah, this is more of something that we actually would show to the sales reps, just so they can kind of get an idea of our culture and what we have going on. So uh, to educate them, so I wouldn't actually bring this into a, a sort of a bar owner or, or anything like that. But let's see what else we have. That's been a little lost. I've looked at the slideshow. So we have uh, three national uh, campaigns. We do uh, St. Patrick's Day. We uh, you know push. We make America stout. Our, you know, there's uh, Guinness, of course, is uh, a big beer on St. Patty's Day. But there's a lot of craft beer bars now that uh, don't pour Guinness. It's not a craft beer. It's a multinational uh, huge brewery, and uh, we sell a lot of milk stout. We do a lot of St. Patty's Day promos and. And features and uh, I do a lot of events around St. Patty's Day, and I try to get a lot of displays in my off-premise accounts. <laughs> and then we have the uh, summer promotion, the lighter side of left. I think we're going to call it the. Uh, we changed the name of that to uh, the left side of life, I believe, for this year. And then we're going after uh, in. Uh, in the fall, we go after, uh, we're trying to promote uh, Thanksgiving because not a lot of craft brewers are going after Thanksgiving and, and America's Stout is a great beer to take home and have with your, with your turkey and your family and your friends over Thanksgiving. 
Just look at our sales deck right now. So this is all our beers, and this is uh, something. This 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 slide and this slide right here is an eight and a half by eleven sheet that uh, I can take into accounts, and I leave with the accounts. And on the back on this slide here has the release dates of all of our beers. Probably one of the coolest things in the two and a half years that I've worked at the brewery that the marketing team has come up with. Because now I can bring samples into account, talk about the beers, and I can leave this information right here. I can see what what we have going on. It's a huge help. And, uh, and like I said, uh, as far as left hand goes, I guess I didn't say this. I'm just kind of thinking back to my intro. So I'm kind of like more akin to like what a beer ranger would do for New Belgium. I'm not like one of the big uh, decision makers in left hand. In uh, so I focus on just selling my product and I work promos. I work all the beer festivals in Arizona, New Mexico. I'm more like the guy on the streets. I'm more the guy like like Chris uh, thinks he, uh, he he recognizes me, and I'm pretty sure he probably does. He's probably seen me around at many different events. <laughs> if he goes to any of these these events in, in Arizona. So now when I'm giving a presentation, I'll go into our seasonal beers. This is uh, quarter one. We've got paid the black. That's our winter beer. Right now we've got our spring, summer, seasonal out. Got the good juju and the great juju. The good juju is a real popular beer in Colorado. And uh, yeah, maybe Nate's mic is picking up. Echoing back. I'm not sure if your your mic is. Uh, Close to your speaker or something, Nate, maybe? I'm going to try turning the volume down a little more to see if that makes it any better for the rest of you. Or if you have like an earphone handy, like a headphones, maybe? I wonder if that would work. Yeah, I'll try that. Uh, we'll see. Let's see. Oh, it is. Let me know, uh, Bill, and, and everyone else, if it seems any better for you guys. I think it's gone. I think that's whatever you did there. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. <laughs> that was kind of annoying. It's a lot better now, so I'm happy. So, anyways, yeah, in the presentation, I've run through my uh, seasonals. Good juju is an ale spice with ginger. We actually juice the ginger. It's a super refreshing beer. It happens to be what I'm drinking right now, and uh, it was just kind of a random pick out of my fridge, actually. But uh, this is a very refreshing beer. We take organic ginger and juice it. So it's a, a nice, uh, easy drink in summertime kind of beer. And then the great juju is uh, in like a, a double juju, 7.2%. That's a nice, uh, comes in bombers, and we have some slim kegs. Very limited, though. Looks like Chris almost bought that tonight. All right. So here's our St. Patrick's Day, like I was talking, featuring the Milk Stout. We have a national campaign with our new, uh, our growing marketing team. We push the uh, the America Stout idea. Dan, I'm curious. Uh, so obviously St. Patty's Day came and went. Do you get um, after after that campaign has come and gone? Does the marketing team sort of follow back up with you in terms of sales figures and and whether or not they thought uh, that campaign was was successful? Yeah, we do a little uh, a little recap and. I'm not sure if uh, I think we look at the numbers and all that and uh, see what we sold. Uh, we, we have uh, VI, we track all of our sales on VIP. It's a program, it's uh, an industry program. So, yeah, we definitely have a nice uh, little spike around St. Patty's Day. And we get in a lot of accounts that we've never been in, too, with uh, having the reps push St. Patty's Day, which is also, oh, the Nooks, thank you. Thank you there, York Brian, 44. <laughs> So, this is one of our merchandise and POS. So we'll have the distributors. Uh, we'll split the cost on this stuff with our distributors and have them sometimes work some promos with us, or we'll have them do some on their own. How do we uh, let's see? Here's a question, Eric. How do you own American Stout? I think we. Uh, I'm not sure if we own that or not. Actually, that's a good question. I think we might have. Uh, 
there might be a little trademark on there. I can't see this is so small on my uh, screen. But uh, so that's a good question. I'm not sure if we actually own American Stout or not. And yeah, we do. Uh, that seems like it might be a, a little too familiar of a term for it to be trademarkable. Yeah, I'm really not sure. Curious. We do own a nitro milk stout. Uh, so nobody can call it their left hand nitro milk stout. And I don't know if anybody pays attention to the news. We did have a little social media thing. We <laughs> we tried to. Uh, we we were afraid that uh, one of the big guys like Budweiser was going to take the name nitro and kind of copyright or trademark it, so we couldn't use it. So we put in to do that, and then uh, some social media picked it up and. A little bit of negative, uh, negative blitz for a couple of days. I think it was a little, little nerve wracking, but it all went away. <laughs> yeah, we do. You know, we keep track of our press hits and uh, all of our social media. Yeah, so this is what I would be doing. Just a little recap here of our beers and. Uh, There's our there's our new market expansion, New England, Northwest, California, Nevada, New Orleans, like I said, Alaska. We're gonna go back to Alaska this year. And I don't know. So that's pretty much uh, our deck that we I kinda run through when I'm talking to sales reps. Uh anybody have any questions or comments or And maybe while uh, folks are coming up with the zinger to stump you with, um, talk a little bit about your sales process. If say there's a new beer bar that opens in your territory, what's the what's your sales process for uh, trying to get left hand installed on a handle? Um, I, I sell beer uh, kind of old school. I build, I, I build relationships to try to get to know people. Uh, you know, we're a pretty well known brand. We're established. You know, in our market out here in Arizona and in Mexico, but uh, I always uh, I bring samples in. But it's uh, it's getting tougher and tougher to sell beer. And you know, when a new account opens, there's more and more people going in trying to sell their beers these days. So I try to be uh, friendly and uh, respectful and nice. And uh, I think there's some pushy salesmen out there, but I think. Uh, I'm not sure if these days being a pushy salesman is the greatest thing. I think uh, following up and being uh, persistent is good, but but I, you know, I present my beers and let the people taste my beers and talk about the quality. We focus on quality, and uh, maybe I'll talk about some of the metal we won. But but I try to be pretty humble. I don't uh, walk in with a big attitude, or you know, I see some different breweries walking around with the uh, with their. Uh, their, their chest, chests all puffed out and, and thinking there's something special because they work at a brewery, but I, I try to remain pretty humble and uh, I kind of learned this from people that I've hung out with in the beer industry that are quite a bit further along than myself. Like I just happened to, uh, a couple months ago, had the pleasure of hanging out and drinking beers with a guy named Doug Odell. And I'm sure you probably all heard of Doug Odell. He's a really cool dude, but he's one of the most humble individuals uh, you'd probably ever meet. He's uh, passionate about what he does, but if you're sitting down drinking a beer with him, he would never really talk about how he's Doug Odell and started this great brewery, <laughs> you know. He likes to go to Filiberto's, which is a fast food, cheap Mexican joint. you got to go to Filiberto's and hang out with a, a beer salesman like myself and uh, the high rollers. And uh, it seems like a lot of successful people in the beer business are, they started out making no money, started out home brewing. Uh, same thing with left hand. Eric Wallace and Dick Dorf uh, were mechanical engineers in the Air Force in '93. They got out in their home brewing up in Colorado in the early '90s, drinking beers, kind of looking for jobs, and they kind of got to the point where they decided they didn't really want to get real jobs, and they had this idea like, "Hey, what if we uh, what if we try to sell our beer that we're making? You know, it's pretty good beer," and that's that's what happened. And they they chose Longmont based on the water quality. Of Longmont, uh, the beer comes out of the front range, and it's uh, they did the water testing from all the the the, uh, the municipalities around the front range, and uh, Longmont had the best water quality for the beers they wanted to make. 
So that's why they started uh, in Longmont, and then uh, the recently Oscar Blues moved uh, moved up to Longmont too. And they were up in Lyons. They didn't. Uh, I'm sure the water is as good or better in Lyons as it is in Longmont, but they moved down to Longmont for for a tax break. They wanted to open up, up a big brewery in uh, in Lyons. It wasn't into helping them out their taxes. In Longmont was. So how do you determine which establishments to target? How do you find out? That's a good question. Uh, a lot of it's word of mouth. A lot of the stuff I hear just maybe hanging out in the bar, having somebody talk about uh, a new account they heard about, or in, a, in an ideal world, the uh, the distributor guys will tell me about a new account, and I'll go in. But uh, that doesn't seem to happen as much as it used to with uh, a lot more breweries out there. And my big breed, my big distributor out here has got a guy whose full-time job is to uh, open up new accounts. So I try to keep in contact with that guy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, not every establishment is the right place for, for craft beer, for our beer. There's a lot of uh, convenience stores out in, uh, you know, the, the outskirts of town that uh, if I could sell a beer, a case, case or two of beer into it, you know, it may sit there and go out of code because nobody knows what the beer is and they're going in and buying, you know, Miller Highlight for or whatever. Uh, York, Brian, which beer festivals do I target? My sales territory, I... I uh, we we try to not really go after the, the big drunk fests. I try to go after ones with you know, maybe raising money for a good cause, and maybe there's going to be a good crowd there that's uh, into our beer. And uh, I'm kind of selective. There's more and more sales, uh, more and more beer festivals out there, and I'm trying to be a little more selective. Just this last weekend, I was down in Tucson. We had a, a great festival. Uh, raising money it was the fire department down there raised a bunch of money for kids for the the kids uh, for like a toys for tots type thing in Tucson. That was a great a great festival, and I I do try to look at it now. I look at what the what are they donating to charity. This this festival is probably the first one I've actually worked where all the uh, all, all the hours put into the festival were all volunteer hours by firefighters and their family and friends, and 100% uh, of the money went to the kids. We have some other festivals that I think they're padding their own pockets, you know. I think they're saying they're raising money for a charity, but I'm not sure how much money actually goes to the charity. And That's something I'm starting to do. I'm trying to get people riled up. My other brewery compadres around here, like, we should take a look at what these festivals are. They're all charity fundraisers because the best of the liquor license requires. And I mean, if a guy's giving a check for 200 bucks and putting 10 grand in his pocket, is it worth is it worth it, you know? I don't think so. So which distributor to this left hand do you have in Arizona? Any issues? Yeah, you know, we have three distributors in Arizona. The Knacker Beverage Company up north, and they do the uh, outskirts of the whole whole state. We've got uh, Crescent Crown Distributing here in Phoenix. They're a big Miller Coors house, and then we've got Finley Distributing down in Tucson. They're all kind of based Miller Coors. And craft beer, and I think uh, you have issues with every distributor. I'm, I think probably every brewery. <laughs> it's always going to be a, a challenge. You know, you wish it would be great if uh, the only brewery with uh, all of my distributor, all of our distributors, sold just left hand. <laughs> Life would be great, right? <laughs> but uh, a lot of uh, sales reps are they get paid on the bigger beers, Miller Coors, Blue Moon. All those uh, those big breweries, so so it's always challenging, and I try to build good rapport with my sales reps. It's a, almost it's more important to me than under, know my sales reps than than know my accounts because uh, a lot of times they kind of control what happens in those accounts. You can have a great uh, reputation with a with a buyer in an account, but maybe the sales rep doesn't like me or doesn't know me or know my beers, and he might uh, try to talk him into another beer that he sells. Or so that's. Uh, that's something I'm constantly working on. I think I can always do better at getting to know my sales reps. Tomorrow I'm going to go out for lunch with one of my sales reps in Phoenix here. And I try to buy people lunch and drink beers with them occasionally and try to catch up and figure out what's going on and ask if they can help me out. Big relationship uh, business. And the distributors as well. Having good relationships with the distributors is uh, the, the guys that are running the distributors, they... Uh, 
they think I'm a jerk. They're still going to sell my beer, but uh, they're not going to uh, help me as much as they are if they like me. So I'm trying to I try to keep people happy, but you also have to kind of stand up for your 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 brewery. And things aren't going right. You got to kind of put your foot down, and that's challenging. <laughs> so, you know, you send an email to somebody, you don't get a response, and it gets frustrating. Josh Goldberg says, "Well, oh, oh, you're up in Longmont. Great guy." Yeah, we don't do uh, nearly the, uh, so those are, the yeah, Josh, we have a, this great thing called the, uh, we have a left-hand foundation. Uh, we had some terrible floods. I'm not sure if you all heard about those floods a couple of years back. Uh, Longmont was nearly wiped out with uh, huge floods, and uh, we did a lot to raise money for that. But then after that, we decided, well, let's let's get a big uh, fund going. So we, now we have the left-hand foundation. I think it's called the left-hand foundation. But, yeah, Josh Goldberg is a, uh, in charge of all that stuff, great guy. And then we do five, uh, we call it the high five events. We do five big events every year. And uh, so we have the hops and handrails that just happened. We ship in snow from uh, from the mountains, and we have a big snowboard ramp and competition and a big beer festival. And uh, that one was huge this year. We moved it to a, a big park in, in Long Mountain and raised a bunch of money. So yeah, we raised like millions of dollars. Uh, Every year, we also uh, are big on the, uh, the bike MS, the ride MS. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the uh, the ride bike MS. It's a multiple sclerosis fundraiser, and we are the beer sponsor for five of them right now. And we go into a we do a big event in Colorado. I think we have like several hundred riders in Colorado, but the team left hand they they put on left hand jerseys and we ride, we pour the beer, and we have raised. Over, oh, like, I think we raised over a million dollars last year. I think we're close to a million dollars this year already before our first ride. So we've really uh, stepped that up, and we're just trying to uh, be good community partners. And uh, New Belgium has toured a fat. We're going to start uh, getting more and more of these uh, ride MS things. It's great publicity. Plus, we're doing a great thing. I actually did the ride in North Carolina last year. I uh, rode 100 mile, 150 miles in two days, and I raised 1200 bucks on my own for my own friends. I'll be hitting Nate up pretty soon for some uh, some money for my ride in uh, November this year. <laughs> Anything you need. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we do. Uh, that's like uh, being a good community partner, good good community uh, members, I guess, is what uh, what we're doing. And that reminds me uh, also, uh, along with that, we're uh, we're going to employee ownership this year in July. We're all real excited about that. That's uh, something New Belgium does, and. Uh, I guess Full Sail did that, right? But they uh, they just sold, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure how many yeah, agree about I always remember I drank a lot of Full Sail over the years, and I always remember reading the bottle, and it said employee owned. But New Belgium. And, and the, the reason we're, one reason we're doing this is because uh, a lot of these breweries are being bought and sold these days, and uh, Eric Wallace and Dick Doerr are, are uh, huge uh, fans of uh, the Longmont community, and they don't want to... Uh, get to a point where they can sell the brewery, so it be a little more employee ownership, so we have a little bit of say, and I think we're actually going to change our packaging to reflect that, and you know, it's going to be like, something like, uh, our new tagline is going to be like, furiously employee owned, or something like that, something to the effect of like, or something independent, I can't remember, I'll think of it, uh, but anyways, we're going to, uh, we're very proud of the fact that we're going to employee ownership, and we're going to try to let people know but we are fiercely independent or something like that is our tagline. I think it might be fiercely independent. But uh, well, there's a lot of breweries uh, being bought and sold right now, uh, our size and smaller and bigger. And, uh, I'm sure you've all heard about the about that recently. What's the toughest part of trying to win a new account? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I think... Uh, just building relationships is uh, the toughest thing. There's a lot, a lot of craft beer bars, uh, you know, like-minded people to me, so it's very easy for me to go go in and get to know the folks and uh, sell my beer and having them on the same page as I am. But then there's a lot of these higher-end places, and, and uh, I'm not quite as comfortable in those those high-end places where you have to make appointments and 
you know, it's hard to, harder for me to explain to those people about my beer. <laughs> so I definitely have more, more trouble selling beers on the higher end accounts. And uh, I'm really good at selling beer to dirt bags and uh, cool craft beer bars. <laughs> Folks who ride mountain bikes and uh, drink beer and ski and that kind of stuff. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pro at talking to. I know a New York trooper does a great <laughs> job of selling her beer. All right. Actually, like that shouldn't school. be his job. Yeah. <laughs> we actually had a guy, uh, a couple of our fellow employees got pulled over on the East Coast, and, uh, and uh, they're late to a festival. And they, they told the cop, well, sorry, we're kind of running late right now. We're going to a beer festival. And I guess the cop kind of let him go because he, he's a big fan of left hand. <laughs> Oh, oh he's the guy. It has to be the same story. That's crazy. That's funny. Yeah, we heard that. Uh, that that's a great story. Uh, I guess uh, the, the trooper called his buddy or something. Is like if this guy knows Left Hand Brewing Company. I'm gonna let you guys out of the ticket. And I guess he held his cell phone up on the speakerphone. <laughs> and uh, and then I guess the trooper <laughs> came out to. Uh, Came out to the brewery. I think I just missed him by a day, but I was—he uh, was out at the brewery partying with his friends, and uh, I guess he had a great time. And he's a huge fan. That's pretty, pretty awesome. But uh, Bill knows about that. <laughs> I'll have to tell the guys about that. <laughs> True, Oliver. Yeah, there you go. A beer salesman never lies. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. Every that's kind cool. Of salesman that doesn't have to. Exactly. Dan, one of the things that uh, you mentioned before we got started um, was w one of the sales tricks every once in a while that you end up doing is uh, having a, at like a shift meeting at a restaurant, or if you have a, a new handle or a new draft op option at a restaurant, you might just show up during shift change and, and talk for five minutes with the servers about the beer? Yeah, sure I do. I'll bring sales sheets. That's something, I guess, if you guys are opening up, uh, trying to get into the, the business or, or, you know, open up a brewery and getting handles. Yeah, I want to, I educate the staff on the, yeah, we do shift change. Like sometimes there'll be a little staff meeting, you know, before a shift or after a shift and I'll uh, find out when that is and show up with sales sheets and, bunch of stickers and maybe some keychains or something and uh, try to educate them about the the brewery and uh, you know craft beer is more more about the story too it's about the quality and the flavor of the beer and all that but it's also about the story and I encourage people to check out our website and and I, you know my big accounts I try to spend time getting to know the people that sell the beer too so when, when they're somebody asks them what's good you know they might mention my beer over something else because uh, they know me, or they just have a staff training with me, or maybe they're on the website and they learn a little something about the brewery. Or they saw that we raised a bunch of money for a lot of charities or something. I don't know. You know, it's uh, all those things, I guess, you know, help sell the beers. So, yeah, Milk Style is by far the, the best seller. And we sell it's Milk Style. Uh, it's all about the relationship, and uh, that's pretty much. Uh, I think what I'm, I'm an expert at, I don't think I'm like uh, a real big uh, numbers guy. Uh, some some reps are really good at talking about uh, the cost and how much money you're going to save and all this. I'm, I'm more about building relationships. Yeah, I talk about the medals we won. This, this Milk Style won a gold medal last two years ago, and, or a sawtooth, but uh, yeah, more about the, the story. But yeah, Milk Stouts are uh, our biggest seller by far. It's a little more than 50% of what we make. And we sell that several different. We sell non nitro and non nitro in package and kegs. So that's like four. That's you know a couple different ways we sell that. And uh, sawtooth is our number two beer. We sell a lot of sawtooth up in Colorado. That's our ESB. And uh, then I'd say it's probably our seasonals after that. And uh, post star pilsner. And I think, you know, our seasonals are, are really good. We're going to get a fourth seasonal. We're trying to do a little more chain stuff. And right now we've got three seasonals. And, you know, like your Kroger's, your Fry's, your Safeway's, they're kind of set up now for four seasonals. So we're going to try to get another seasonal so we can have like a – we don't have such a lag time between our, our you know, 
the three season we don't have to stretch them out as long but that's that's kind of what we're probably pushing more and we're trying to get into more chains nowadays as, as we grow we have a chain guy now like new belgium has like i want to say 10 or 15 uh guys that just sell to the chains you know on premise and off premise there's two different teams and you know, we have one one guy right now that does all that, and last year we didn't have anybody doing that. So as we grow, we try to we're, we're trying to expand our product into more uh, bigger bigger things, bigger chains. You know, but uh, I don't know where to go with that. I don't know if I answered your question. I don't remember what your question was anymore, but. Uh, <laughs> How early the seasonals making an appearance? Uh, well, we kind of have them all. We have a kind of set launch dates for our, our three seasonals, and uh, we just uh, we try to ride through the full season. But sometimes we run out if a distributor doesn't order enough or whatever. But yeah, we get Oktoberfest out pretty early, you know, like late August. But of course, in Germany, Oktoberfest is in September, so. In, uh, I'm very, very happy we don't have a Christmas beer because those are no fun to sell after December 25th, after January 1st, you know. <laughs> um, Oktoberfest can get a little stressful to sell when you have a whole bunch in the warehouse and someplace and that's, uh, you know, November, December, but that's uh, part of the job, I guess. But seasonals are always kind of scary. You want to, especially now that we're getting into more chains, we try to forecast for production and uh, when a distributor orders that not have too little but not have too much and uh, it really sucks having you know either side of that not having enough and running out uh, is, is not good and then having too much is maybe even worse I'm going to try to sell a bunch of beer towards the end of the season before it goes out of code we're pretty pretty careful about our code dates so that's always something kind of scary with the seasonals. But, uh, yeah, that that's a pretty interesting topic in terms of both from the sort of production management aspect for some of these small potential brewers to think about it. Uh, when you know, how do you balance brewing your next seasonal uh, when you still have a bunch of a bunch of your current seasonal out in the tray that you're trying to let let get sold off before uh, the new popular yeah. stuff hits and goes up and and makes it even harder to sell the the previous seasonal. Yeah, that's always stressful for me when we have uh, say we have a bunch of juju in the warehouse and uh, October fest is coming <laughs> or fade to black and the juju is coming. That seems to happen every once in a while, but. We've been doing a little better with that, but that's always yeah something to think about. Yeah, I suppose like smaller. If you're a brew pub, you can kind of change. I've seen seen those Christmas beers. They the name changes. It's the same kind of beer, but maybe the name will change to uh, the winter warmer or something like that, right? <laughs> it's your Christmas beer till December, and then it's uh, your winter warmer or whatever. The name can change. Yeah, but we can't uh, we can't do that. <laughs> We take great pride in our uh, Oktoberfest and our Pilsner. Uh, the grower head brewer was trained in Germany, and that's uh, true lagers. We spend five. We actually have uh, spent a lot more money on, on big tanks. We have these six, four hundred eighty barrel fermenters outside right now. We've got I think four more on the way, and uh, we, we we have those so we can lager our beers properly. Our Polestar Pilsner and our in our Oktoberfest, you know, it takes two months in the tanks. It eats up a lot of space for beers we can be turning real quick. Like Milk Stout we can make in two weeks or Good Juju. We, it takes us a couple of weeks to turn those beers. So we spend a lot of time uh, on, our, on, our, on our quality, but uh, sometimes it kind of hurts us on tank space. And, but we, we're working through the shortages. We don't have them too much anymore, but... Seems like a lot of breweries out there are having having capacity issues, and sometimes we have a little bit of trouble with our our, our loggers, but uh, we're getting better <laughs> as we go. But it seems like the the problems small breweries have, big breweries have too. I think sometimes 
just keeping up with the beer. Uh, yeah, so, so I do. I, I we have a new beer called the Introvert coming out. It's going to be a lower IPA. It's shipping pretty soon. I haven't actually seen the uh, final product. So being out here in Arizona, I'm pulling up the sales sheet because I don't remember much about the beer. But it's uh, what is it? Four point eight percent. Yeah. So and it's called the Introvert. And uh, we're excited about that. That's kind of becoming real soon. I'm not sure. Next couple of weeks, I think. We're shooting for mid-May release dates around town, so around, around the country, I guess. So it'll be interesting to see how it uh, how it's kind of scary for uh, for me thinking about the fact we're going to put this beer in 32 states or however many states we're in right now. I think we're in 29 states, and uh, it's a logistical. Uh, tough thing, I think. <laughs> Trying to get new beer out there. We don't do it that often, so it'll be kind of interesting to see, but I'm sure we'll get a lot of beer out there. We have to look out for the introvert. What we did is we uh, we, uh, we had a great paleo called The Stranger, which I really loved, and it had some uh, rye in the malt. And it wasn't a very hoppy beer, but it had some character to it, and uh, it just wasn't quite selling for us, so we decided to uh, buy a session IPA. We'll see what happens. We're probably a little late to the game. Even New Belgium has their slow ride. Uh, the Pinner is out there. I love that beer. My favorite uh, that I've tried so far is that Ballast Point uh, Even Keel. I don't know if anybody's tried that, but uh, if you get Ballast Point where you are, check out the Even Keel. It's a delicious beer. Yep, Stranger is uh, gone. We don't have any. Might be a little bit left on the shelf right now. In fact, it's. I saw some today, but it's still good till the middle of May, code-wise. So I would imagine, like, towards the end of May, hopefully there will be no more on the shelves anywhere. And if you see it, it might be out of code, but I hope not. <laughs> but, yeah, so we killed the stranger. It, was, uh, it wasn't quite performing for us like we thought it would. Even with that great name and that great label. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the stranger, guys and girls, but... Anyways, that was a fun beer, but we're moving on to the introvert now. And, uh, Two question, Chris. I personally deal with auto code beer. Yeah, I check code dates, and it's kind of our distributor's job to, uh, to deal with code dates. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of like the uh, the quality guy too. So I check code dates, and I look at code dates on kegs. In, in package and shelf life for our beers is uh, 120 days for most of them and then some we actually can age some of our big uh, our big most series we can age for years we have like dates that are several years out I think our, uh, our Oak Age Wake Up Dead has a 2018 code date so some of our beers age well our lagers seem to last pretty long and, and in fact our, our great juju our ginger beer has a, but the ginger is a weird kind of preservative. So we have like, oh, what our code date? I think it's 120 days, but I mean it's, you can drink it up to a year old and it tastes pretty good still, in my opinion. But eight years of life, the nitro beer, yeah, we, I think it's a little bit shorter, but like we have a Wake Up Dead Nitro, which is a big beer, with 10.2 percent uh, Russian Imperial Stout, and we actually didn't know we. Uh, we gave it a. We figured let's put six months on. I think we just had some age of the year. We've only been making it for a year and a half, two years now. So we we store beer. We have beer all over the. Uh, we have places we store beer, and uh, we're constantly. We can move code dates too, but we're we're keeping an eye on that constantly. And I guess that's a big uh, quality thing. We have uh, five or six quality control people right now, and they they taste the beer before it goes into the kegs and before we fill kegs. It's kind of interesting, actually. I was just in a training seminar recently. Uh, so everybody's got a smartphone now. All the uh, quality, we have a, a tasting panel. And before they package, or before they keg beer, somebody from the tasting panel has to uh, actually taste it, even with all the, uh, the high-tech stuff we have, all the computers and all the, uh, the high-tech stuff, we still, that's there, our end-all. 
And so, like, as they get ready to package, an automatic uh, text message goes out to 15 people at the brewery, and uh, the closest person will reply, like, I'm going to go, I'll do this. And so they go taste our beer, which is pretty interesting. So it's still, like, with all the technology we have and the, the you know, the the the, uh, the 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 checks and everything, we still kind of are old school at the end. Do we need more quality control, folks? I think we're – actually, I think there's a – there's a huge uh, job open right now on our, our website for quality control. Chief of quality, I think it's called. So, yeah, we're, we, we, we're looking for a quality control guy right now. Check it out on the website. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so the technology is kind of interesting. Like a lot of stuff's on the, uh, for, the, for our breweries now on the smartphone. They can, guys can change uh, temperature in tanks, and uh, they can see if there's a problem with the tank. Like if it, a temperature will spike. There'll be a warning get gets sent out to all the brewers. So whoever's on call will have to go in and deal with it. But who eats the cost of auto code beer? This is a pretty good question. Uh, it's in, we don't have a, we have a contract, and uh, the distributor eats the cost of uh, auto code beer with our brewery. And as 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 far as I know, the only brewery that picks up uh, auto code beer is uh, Sam Adams, and I, I'm pretty sure I'm right about that. So you buy uh, buy our beer, it sits in the warehouse, it goes out of code, or sits in an account, it goes out of code, it's uh, on the distributor. So that's uh, sometimes why, and that's uh, that's a that's a constant uh, constant battle. <laughs> you know, trying to make sure you don't wear out of something, but make sure you have enough. Who takes care of the tap lines? Really good question. Uh, our distributors take care of the. I think that's actually different than. Uh, in uh, different states, so I, I can speak to Arizona, New Mexico. Our distributors clean the tap lines. In uh, in Arizona, a lot of companies, a lot of distributors have third parties that, that clean the draft lines. But yeah, we have two weeks. Every two weeks, our draft lines are are supposed to be cleaned, and that's another thing I, I check once in a while. New Belgium was kind of like the leader, I think, in quality, and we kind of. You know, I think all breweries kind of keep an eye on each other. We're we're friend we're friendly with New Belgium, and we kind of watch what New Belgium does. They're they're ten steps ahead of us right now, and they have a huge uh, huge quality control department. And they they kind of uh, they actually go out and check their draft lines and check the uh, make sure everything's going good, and, and we're we're kind of following suit with them. But that's something kind of interesting. I think that the craft beer world does. We all kind of help each other out, even though. Yeah, maybe we're in competition, but at the end of the day, it's still the craft beer community, which is uh, something I kind of am a big fan of. Uh, especially down here in Arizona, I'm friends with uh, pretty much all the breweries. We all hang out, and of course, we're all in competition, but also uh, we all travel around together to all the beer festivals, and and I see them in all the accounts and. Uh, we went on the Angels Trumpet uh, on a Friday afternoon. I know there's going to be four or five uh, beer reps from other breweries out hanging out drinking beers. So that's kind of interesting. It's a cool thing if we're selling uh, uh, riffing or something. I don't know if it would be the same. <laughs> right. And can you talk a little bit about, uh, so Arizona is maybe not quite as far along as some of the other beer markets, I'm thinking of maybe Denver, or Portland, of course, or San Diego. Yep. What is the role? You talked about training servers, but um, what what do you think your role in terms of training your customer base to enjoy craft beer if they really only know uh, some of the mass marketed conventional stuff? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, we still sell beer one pint at a time in left hand and uh, yeah, have, you know, just sitting down talking to uh, the guy sitting next to you at the bar is, uh, or, or or the uh, the promo. I guess we do a lot of promos and uh, beer festivals and stuff, but actually having somebody come over and talk to you about the beer is, uh, I mean, I try to be very nice to everybody I talk to. Uh, you know, at a beer festival, some guy might want to talk to me for 10 minutes and I might not have time, but... Uh, but I try to take uh, anybody that talks to me that wants to talk to me about our beer. I try to make the time to talk to them. It's uh, flattering when somebody says how much they like left hand, or they want to tell me that story about the first time they tried a milk stout and how that got them hooked on craft beer. 
uh, it's awesome, and uh, <laughs> I love it. And, uh, but yeah, educating the customers is, uh, is you know, we just try to educate the customers and the, uh, of course, the uh, the brewery reps and the uh, and the, the bar staff and the uh, folks in the the liquor stores. It's uh, kind of an ongoing thing, I guess. And and now people are getting more and more into beer, so it's getting easier. But it's still, I think, you know, I I mean, maybe I'll give somebody a keychain or something and, uh, at a beer festival, and, and, you know, two years later, they'll be like, hey, man, like, check this out. You gave this to me two years ago, you know, and, like, you're really nice to me. We had a nice conversation. It's like, oh, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't remember giving you the, the keychain, but it's all about relationships and, and uh you know, I think there's some breweries out there that might not uh, quite appreciate that to get to a level where they're maybe not selling beer one pint at a time, but we're still doing the, uh, we still try to sell beer one pint at a time. And uh, if I can go to a promo, it's, uh, it's a quiet night. Maybe I talk to uh, three people that are really cool. I consider it a success. Sometimes I go to a promo and there's uh, 100 people there, and, and that's cool too. Maybe I won't connect with anybody, <laughs> you know. So, or man, I've got this, uh, now I've got a logo car, so I'll be filling up my gas tank and somebody will come up and start talking to me sometimes or like at a grocery store or something when I'm not working or people will come up and talk to me. I guess that's part of the, part of the deal with owning a company car. <laughs> but so I'm kind of like always, uh, what about, uh, I'll go ahead. I'm curious, Dan, uh, have you seen in the last couple of years, I know one of the things up here in Portland that's happening is a lot of bars are going to sixth barrels or quarter barrels because they're trying to add additional taps to to have more craft on. Is that something yeah. you're seeing? Is that Are you guys changing your draft op options in, to oh, yeah. in response? Yeah, I mean, we try to, we, we saw a lot of six barrels. We we would uh, in a perfect world I think probably everybody would love to sell more half barrels because there's better margins on them but uh, yeah we we're selling more and more six barrels and and uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of places opening up that are yeah cramming those jockey bob those boxes full of six barrels and yeah I think that's a good thing though and we have a lot, I, it's a lot harder to sell beer now I think in these rotating accounts um, you you probably have them up in Portland too where you know, you go to a go to a, your your kick-ass craft beer bar tonight, and then uh, tomorrow there's gonna be different beers on tap, and that's cool for, for the consumer. But sometimes it's harder for me to keep my beer going through. I've got to be a little more persistent with like, hey man, like let's keep my beer rotating through. Sometimes you get the, when there's uh, so many beers out there, it gets tougher with all these rotating accounts. But uh, but it's a good thing too. But a lot of times I'll have a really great uh, craft beer that rotates their handles, and I'll have a little bar across the street that has a milk stout handle, uh, you know. I have four tap handles, and I'll have milk stout on, and I'll sell more beer at that little divey cool bar that uh, doesn't rotate all the time. But that's kind of interesting. Uh, will we ever see our beer in cans? Uh, we, we say we, you know, we're not going to can. We Eric Walsh. Leaves the glasses the uh, a better vessel for 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 beer and uh, I know it's a big uh, canning is a big thing but we get locally uh, made glass up in Colorado so uh, you know aluminum is a non renewable source and and uh, so we have no plans of canning but I think at some point uh, maybe things will change but no, nothing in the foreseeable future next ten years I would say we won't be canning. But at some point, who knows? There might be uh, there's gonna be a brewery on every corner, right? <laughs> and, uh, we'll see what happens, right? You never know. I guess uh, never say never, right? But uh, nothing anytime soon. We're really happy with the, the bottles. Initiates the tap takeover. The places like the Plains or the Monk. You're the distributor. It's kind of a combination, I think, of uh, both. Uh, we 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 uh, we work together. Our distributors and. In the accounts, so you know they'll they'll say, hey, let's do the left hand tap takeover. And, but yeah, we work uh, we work pretty hard together on those. Like Flannies is a, in a great account in Tempe, Arizona. Where they do they used to do one tap takeover a month where they put like 30 beers from one brewery up, and it takes a lot of work to do. I've had one there, and it was uh, pretty awesome. 
I'm not sure if Chris was there or not, but uh, but uh, it's a lot of work. But yeah, the uh, I guess usually the bar is the one that wants to do that. They want to do a tap takeover to pull a lot of people into their account for a brew that they love, and yeah, the place gets nuts. <laughs> Yeah, Flannies is a, it's a very cool. There's a lot of great places in Arizona to drink beers, and I'm sure you guys up in Portland uh, have twice, two to three times more. <laughs> cool place. We have uh, we have a good good craft beer culture here in Arizona. I'm proud to be a proud to be a, a member of the craft beer community here in Arizona. And uh, that's uh, something I, I work hard at too is trying to be cool, trying to be cool to people. Hopefully, I've uh, maybe seen Chris and been nice to him at some point. I don't know. <laughs> that sounds like he lives uh, pretty close to me. But uh, what else? Anything else, Nate, that you can think of? We're kind of getting towards the end here. Last last couple of minutes, anybody else have a last burning question? Um, You know, maybe one question I would have, Dan, is is sort of how often are you in touch with the home office in terms of trying to get new marketing materials or things like that? Is it are you is it like a weekly uh, sales yeah, meeting probably, that you yeah. dial in for? Is it something less often? We probably have a weekly meeting or something where we talk about what's new, what's coming on, and uh, the social media stuff. Like sometimes we'll get emails daily or whatever. Which the social media thing is pretty interesting, I guess, too. Uh, I get something that takes off on Twitter or whatever, where like 20, 30,000 people see something that's kind of cool. But yeah, we communicate. Uh, I communicate with the brewery on a regular basis, probably uh, several times a week. And uh, it's kind of kind of tough to keep uh, who manages the marketing group in the long run. I think there's just like a marketing. It's all in in internal. So we have somebody like a marketing manager in charge of a, a team, a whole team of folks. Uh, I think it's like five or six people. So it's it's all it's all internal. We don't have anything, uh, you know, outside. Yep. For marketing, but yeah, we have uh, some some ladies we know are really good at social media. And every once in a while, we get something that'll hit and go big. I'm not sure if anybody saw the uh, the left hand leprechaun. Over St. Patty's Day, if you have a chance to Google that, Google that or YouTube it. Kind of interesting. It's my friend Bubba, who's a sales rep, who uh, has been at the brewery for 20 years, and he's not really acting; he's just kind of being himself. So check that out <laughs> on YouTube. I'm not sure what it's called, but I think it's something to do with Left Hand Leprechaun. Check that out. But uh, right on. Yeah, I think uh, we have run our hour out. Um, Thank you so much, Dan, for your time. I think this has been really helpful. I think a lot of you uh, are getting to the point where you need to start thinking about um, the the hardest or easiest, depending on who you're talking to. But uh, that tough point of actually selling the beer, it's easy to make it. Well, you know, easy is relative, but... um, you can make all the beer you want, but if no one's buying it, then you're not going to have a successful business. So, yeah, thanks, Dan, for sharing with us how, how the beer biz works for you, and I uh, really appreciate it. All right, guys, I appreciate it, too. Chris, well, maybe we'll see you down here. Let me know. I only see your name. That's, uh, that's all I see, so come up and I'll say hi to me. You see me on that festival. <laughs> but thanks, Dan. I appreciate it, man. Absolutely. Uh, Cheers to all the rest of you, and uh, we'll see you. I'll I'll tune in next week for last live session, and uh, yeah, enjoy that marketing plan part two. Bad dig, right? But uh, yeah, cheers. Have a great night, y'all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nate.